This is AMTV. Hello there everyone, and welcome to part 12 of this series looking at the history and impact of Doctor Who ratings. If you're joining us for the first time, a very warm welcome to you. We hope you stick around for future instalments and check out our previous episodes, which so far cover the first three Doctor's eras. But for now, sit back, relax, and join me once again as we delve back into the wonderfully niche world of Doctor Who ratings and viewing figures. Our destination? Season 12. In the December of 1974, Doctor Who was undergoing another big change. For the last few years, John Pertwee was the Doctor. His cool, suave and action-packed take on the role won over the hearts and minds of millions of viewers. Under his lead, the show was reinvented for the 1970s, introduced a new cast of regulars, iconic new monsters, and saw the debut appearance of the Doctor's biggest rival, the Master. With Tom Baker being announced to take over from Pertwee, it provided some shock to newer viewers of the programme. For many, John wasn't just one of the Doctors, he was the definitive Doctor. And to them, Baker coming in to replace him could have been just as jarring as it was to older fans when they first saw Patrick Troughton take over from William Hartnell. Nevertheless, by 1974, after 11 years on air, Doctor Who was more accustomed to its ever-changing nature, and as such, when the show returned for season 12, it would be with a brand new Doctor, a brand new production team behind him, and in producer Philip Hinchcliffe and script editor Robert Holmes leading the charge. But with all the new coming in, the old wasn't completely ready to be cast aside just yet. Sarah Jane Smith, a companion introduced in Pertwee's final season, was here to stay, and the unit regulars wouldn't go unseen in season 12 either. So let's get into this set of stories, the first for the fourth Doctor, and see how they did. The first story from season 12 is Robot. A series of burglaries perpetrated by something more than human leads the newly regenerated Doctor and unit to the doors of the progressive think tank organisation, which intends to hold the world to ransom. This story is comprised of four episodes, which began airing on the 28th of December 1974 and concluded on the 18th of January 1975. Here are the individual viewing figures for all four episodes and, wow, these are the strongest numbers we've seen for a Doctor's first story. Three of the story's four parts saw over 10 million viewers, and even the least viewed instalment, that being part four with 9 million viewers, is certainly an impressive showing. In terms of the top 40 TV programs chart, all four parts found a place within it, the peak being part two, which settled at 17th place. So with such high numbers for the fourth Doctor's debut, what factors help contribute to this runaway success? Well, the two main factors we must always go to first in this series is promotion and competition. For the former, there was extensive coverage in several newspapers, all of which were either chatting with the new Doctor or promoting his upcoming debut in Robot. Surprisingly, there was no special trailer to help draw up further excitement and no front cover on the Radio Times. This would mark the first time in five years that a season opener for Doctor Who wasn't given that front cover. However, this doesn't seem to have affected the viewing figures all that much. A different kind of promotion arguably came with a repeat. As mentioned in the previous episode, one day before Robot's transmission, the preceding story, Planet of the Spiders, was repeated on BBC One in a compilation form. The repeat attracted 8.6 million viewers, and that being it was the third Doctor's last story, it proved the perfect reminder and lead-in to the brand new Doctor's debut the following day. In terms of competition, ITV was still surprisingly airing a lot of the same shows against Doctor Who as they had done in the last few years. These included popular quiz show, Sale of the Century, and equally popular talent show, New Faces. But whilst these shows had once taken a noticeable chunk out of Doctor Who's ratings, it seems they couldn't maintain that force this time around. However, there was one new show that was aiming to be a real rival to Doctor Who, that being the American import, Planet of the Apes, based off the successful film series of the same name. This show only aired in certain regions, and after having failed in America, the new show sadly failed to make much of an impact over here in the UK either. So, relatively weak competition and strong promotion is always a good combination to achieve high viewing figures, certainly true back in the mid-1970s. As for the story itself, Robot I've always found a weird blend of the old and the new. On the new side of it, Tom Baker is such a breath of fresh air into the programme. Nothing against John Pertwee, I love his take on the role, but Tom Baker is so immediately different, so instantly vibrant, that the contrast between incarnations works beautifully. Aside from Tom though, I've always felt Robot is very much a story intended for the Third Doctor's era. 
It's written by Terence Dix, who had been script editing the show for the past few years, and the story is an Earthbound unit type one, and even the villains in the piece remind me of the kinds of characters we see in the early Pertwee years. This doesn't make Robot a bad story, but one in which where, for me at least, whilst the new Doctor is undoubtedly the standout feature, he feels like he's been dropped in his predecessor's stomping grounds. Still, seeing Tom's toothy smile and quirky persona instantly brings a smile to my face, and only acts as a tantalising glimpse of what's to come for the new Doctor. Overall, this story attracted an average of 10.2 million viewers. This makes it the most viewed opener since Season 10's The Three Doctors, which just pips Robot by 0.1 million. However, as mentioned, a 10.2 million average does make Robot the most viewed introductory story for a new Doctor so far. I would argue this shows that not only was the hype well and truly drummed up for the fourth Doctor's debut, but that the massive growth in audiences seen in the third Doctor's era was here to stick around. A new Doctor was no longer going to put millions of people off the show. Instead, whilst people may have missed Pertwee, they were ready to give Baker a chance to shine. And shine he did. To enjoy the fourth Doctor's first adventure today, you can read the Target book from 1975, or its audio adaptation from 2007, both titled as Doctor Who and the Giant Robot. To watch it, you have the VHS release from 1992, the DVD release from 2007, and the story is also available on Blu-ray as part of the Season 12 collection set. Robot may not be a perfect story, but what it does well, it does really well. The sections in Part 1 dedicated to introducing the new Doctor are excellent. The unit-based stuff, even though more aligned with the Pertwee era, does transition smoothly and seamlessly into this story, and the regulars are delivering fantastic performances, just as they had been doing for years at this point. And even though the titular robot may not be the best realised creature in Doctor Who, a heartfelt performance from Michael Kilgariff, plus some very ambitious effect sequences, help it stand out amongst the pantheon of 70s monsters. It's absolutely worth a watch, and I would argue a neat little jumping on point if you're wanting to get into classic Who. Well, I won't do it. I won't, I won't, I won't! Why should I? Doctor, you're being childish. Well, of course I am. There's no point in being grown up if you can't be childish sometimes. The second story from Season 12 is The Ark in Space. On Space Station Nerva in the far future, the remnants of humanity are held in cryogenic suspension, but the station has been invaded by the parasitic Wirren, who intend to feed on the humans and conquer the Earth. This story is comprised of four episodes, which began airing on the 25th of January 1975 and concluded on the 15th of February. Here are the individual viewing figures for all four episodes, and once again, three of the story's four parts skyrocket over 10 million viewers, the obvious standout being part two, which had 13.6 million people watching. This is the highest individual figure since episode one of The Web Planet, which aired 10 years previously. Part one's 9.4 million figure may be the lowest, but again, that's still a strong number, and when looking at everything else, it's clear that this story was connecting with viewers. For the top 40 programs, all four parts charted, just as they had with Robot. Part 2 charts the highest, taking the program into the top 10, finishing at 5th place. A new peak for Doctor Who in these charts. So with a new peak in Part 2, and strong numbers throughout, just how did the Ark in Space manage to do it? Well, there was no special effort made in the promotional department. However, Doctor Who was making appearances in newspapers for a very different reason. The question of violence in the program had been brought up before in the 1960s, but had largely gone without much heed, from both the press and the production team. Things were heating up again though, with the Honorary Secretary of the National Viewers and Listeners Association, Mary Whitehouse, claiming that Doctor Who was in fact too violent and unsuitable for children. This prompted several articles in national newspapers, with several members of the programme appearing in written form to defend it, including Robert Holmes, Terry Nation, Terence Dix, and Tom Baker himself. Mrs Whitehouse would return again in years to come, where her influence would be more strongly felt. In the realm of competition, ITV's offerings were relatively weak once again. New faces, sale of the century, and reruns of programmes we've seen on this series before, such as Tarzan. British reruns also challenged Doctor Who, in this case the family series The Adventures of Black Beauty, which had originally gone out between 1972 and 1974. However, like with Robot, none of this competition could triumph over the Time Lord, Certainly not when he was consistently pulling audiences of over 10 million each week. The Ark in Space has been cited by many a fan as being one of the greatest achievements in the classic series, whether it be for its foreboding atmosphere aboard the Nerva Beacon, the great steady reveal of the repulsive Wirren, or simply the performances of the lead cast, particularly by Tom Baker, 
who not only arguably had inhabited the role most quickly out of all his predecessors, but was delivering speeches that would go on to be quoted nearly 50 years later. It's a terrific adventure tale, and quite frankly, deserves a lot of the praise it so often gets. Overall, this story attracted an average of 11.1 million viewers, a 0.9 increase from the previous story. Not only is this a magnificent average for a magnificent story, but it's the first time the show averaged over 11 million since The Web Planet, which had roughly 12.6 million viewers watching back in 1965. For Doctor Who to achieve a similarly high figure over 10 years later is testament to the show's longevity, but also its ever-growing popularity. We also have some repeat data for you. 10 days before the beginning of season 13, on Wednesday the 20th of August 1975, The Ark in Space was broadcast as a 70 minute compilation on BBC One. Here are the viewing figures for this repeat, and whilst this is a 2.9 million drop from the average achieved just 6 months earlier, 8.2 million for a repeat screening is very respectable indeed, especially when going out against some of ITV's heaviest hitters, those being soap operas Crossroads and Coronation Street. The Pertwee years successfully revitalised Doctor Who for the 1970s, and with Tom Baker, the show was now continuing to evolve, expand and change, to constantly keep its audiences hooked, scared, but most importantly, entertained. Something which the Ark in Space managed to deliver in spades. To enjoy this classic today, you have the Target book from 1977, or its audio adaptation from 2015. To watch it, you have two different VHS releases, a compilation version from 1989, and an episodic version from 1994. In 1996, it became one of few classic Who stories to be released on the Laserdisc format. Again, on DVD, you have two different releases, the original from 2002, or a special edition re-release from 2013. The Ark in Space is also available as part of the Season 12 collection set, which is exclusive to the Blu-ray format. There's not much more I can add to the Ark in Space that hasn't been said already. It's one of the best examples of 70s Who. With its character work, monster design, use of atmosphere, suspense, it's literally all here. With Robot being a good jumping on point, Ark serves as a perfect follow-up, to introduce people to just the kinds of weird and wonderful adventures the Doctor and his companions can have. An absolute must-watch. Grab it for your library if you haven't already. There they are, out among the stars, waiting to begin a new life, ready to outsit eternity. They're indomitable. Indomitable. The third story from Season 12 is the Sontaran Experiment. Believing the Earth of the far future to be uninhabited, the Doctor, Sarah and Harry encounter Field Major Steyer, the advance guard of a Sontaran invasion. This story is comprised of two episodes, which began airing on the 22nd of February 1975 and concluded the following week on the 1st of March. Here are the individual viewing figures for both episodes, and the high numbers of the Ark in Space have carried on through to this story quite nicely. Both parts sail over 10 million viewers, part 1 achieving the peak with bang on 11 million. For the program charts, both parts charted highly, with part 1 placing 18th and part 2 going one further and placing 17th. The high numbers were here to stay, so fresh off the success of the Ark in Space, what did the Sontaran experiment have to offer viewers? Well, being a two-part story, initially it may seem like not much promotion could be placed on this tale, and indeed there wasn't. No special trailers, no extensive coverage in the newspapers or the Radio Times aside from the usual listings, and as mentioned in the previous episode, by this point, Doctor Who was arguably a national institution. Vast chunks of audience members, even if they weren't regular viewers, would have had a passing familiarity with at least one of the Doctors, the TARDIS, and some of the show's more memorable monsters. To that extent, the show was starting to sell itself, the consistent figures of 10 million and above lending strength to that argument with season 12 stories so far. For competition, it just seems like by this point ITV were happy to surrender the time slot over to Doctor Who. For going up against the Sontaran experiment were the same shows that went up against Robot and The Ark in Space, and despite third time being the charm, that was not the case for these programs here. The Sontaran experiment is a fun little story. It's the first two-parter to go out in 10 years, the last being 1965's The Rescue, and because of its short length, I find it often gets overlooked, or completely passed over when discussed by fans. Whilst it is hard to tell a complete story in two 25 minute episodes, it certainly isn't impossible. Kevin Lindsay returns to portray another member of the malicious Sontaran race, and it's always nice to see a Doctor Who story to be set completely on location. It may be over and done with before you know it, and it's sandwiched between two of the most memorable stories in the show's long history, but it's certainly not one to pass over, especially if you're a fan of the potatoes you love to hate, the Sontarans. 
overall this story attracted an average of 10.8 million viewers, a 0.3 drop from the previous story. Only being two parts and having strong figures for both of them does of course help, but surely this still continues to show how much viewers were enjoying the stories of Season 12 and what they had to offer. We also have some repeat data for this story. In the summer break between Seasons 13 and 14, two stories were selected to air a week's worth of Doctor Who repeats. From Monday the 5th to Thursday the 8th of July 1976, Season 13's Planet of Evil went out, and chosen to close out the week on Friday the 9th of July was the Sontaran Experiment. Here are the viewing figures for that repeat, coming in at a strong 8.2 million, also charting 25th for the week. As Who repeats became more common in the gaps between seasons in the 1970s, it showed that the show definitely had an audience for those who wanted to see past adventures again. Having been a success the previous year, the return of the Sontarans so quickly into the show was bound to draw up significant interest from fans, and newer viewers were arguably there because they enjoyed the new Doctor. This curly-haired bohemian absolutely teeming with life, energy, and enough eccentricities to burst out of the screen. It may not be the crowning gem of season 12, but it certainly is far from being a dud in my opinion. If you want to enjoy the Sontaran experiment today, you can read the Target book from 1978, or its audio adaptation from 2016. To watch it, you have the VHS release from 1991, packaged with Genesis of the Daleks, and as a standalone DVD release from 2006. The Sontaran Experiment is also available on Blu-ray as part of the Season 12 collection set. With so few two-part stories in Classic Who, I would argue that the Sontaran Experiment is up there with the best of them. Steyr is another great tantalising example of what the Sontaran race is like, and the three leads make the most of the little time they've been given, particularly in terms of the outdoor setting. Make sure you don't skip past it on your rewatch. Give it the chance it deserves. I challenge you, Steyr. Single combat. Or are you afraid? Afraid? A Sontaran afraid? The fourth and penultimate story from Season 12 is Genesis of the Daleks. The Doctor travels to the war-torn planet Skaro, where the deranged Davros prepares to unleash the destructive power of the Daleks. The Doctor must avert the creation of his deadliest enemy, but does he have the right? This story is comprised of six episodes, which began airing on the 8th of March 1975 and concluded on the 12th of April. Here are the individual viewing figures for all six episodes, and whilst initially the programme pulls in more than 10 million viewers, numbers do start to drop quite sharply about a third of the way in. With a peak of 10.7 million with part one, and a low of 8.5 million with part three, these are hardly figures to be worried about. For the programme charts, five of Genesis's six parts charted. Part three narrowly missed out, finishing at 42nd, the peak being part two, which charted 15th. So despite being heralded as one of, if not the greatest Doctor Who story of all time, what caused the decline in viewing figures that have been so high and stable for the past three stories? The promotional arm of the programme seemed to shift a bit more into gear around the time Genesis began broadcasting. In the Radio Times, there was a full article dedicated to Doctor Who and the Daleks, featuring interviews with Tom Baker and Dalek creator Terry Nation. With news that the Daleks were going to be returning for a fourth year running, and featured their Genesis no less, this was bound to draw considerable excitement from viewers of all ages. As the story went to air, talks again regarding the violence in Doctor Who were once again raised by Mary Whitehouse. Maybe it's this talk that caused viewers to drop off as the story progressed? Perhaps parents stopped their children watching? Well, it's feasible, but I find it hard to believe that nearly 2 million people dropped off for that reason alone. Competition from ITV was, again, like Luster, the same stable of programmes being turned out against the Time Lord, to little success in the ratings. But despite the drop in numbers, one thing you can't deny is how monumental Genesis of the Daleks was as a story. We are introduced to Davros, the deranged scientist who is responsible for the maniacal Pepper Potts creation. His scenes with the Doctor are sharp, witty and powerful, an encapsulating dynamic between the pair that we only continue to see in years to come. Michael Wisher delivers an unbelievable performance, showcasing that Davros is vastly intelligent and not simply raving mad and how little parts of his character directly influence how the Daleks themselves are, both in their personality and in their actions. I wouldn't call it the greatest Doctor Who story ever made, but it's certainly up there. Overall, this story attracted an average of 9.6 million viewers, a 1.2 drop from the previous story. Whilst this may seem a big dip, keep in mind that for a 9.6 million average across a six-week story is a massive achievement, and still stands as one of the strongest examples. We also have lots of repeat data for you. In fact, I would say that Genesis of the Daleks is the most repeated story of the classic series. 
The first re-airing came at the very end of 1975. Chosen as the Christmas repeat, an idea that had proven successful over the past few years, an 85-minute edit of Genesis was aired on BBC One on Saturday the 27th of December. Here are the viewing figures for this repeat, and while 7.2 million may be the lowest showing for these Christmas repeats so far, it's not a catastrophe by any means. The next time viewers would get to see the story would be in the summer of 1982. Broadcast as part of Doctor Who and the Monsters, Genesis was aired across two Mondays, the 26th of July and the 2nd of August, as two bumper-length episodes. Here are the viewing figures for this repeat, and whilst a 5 million average may seem low, bear in mind this was going out in the middle of summer. Airing in the heart of British summertime, with more people outdoors, that wouldn't have helped, and with strong competition against ITV soap Coronation Street, lower figures almost seemed inevitable. Eleven years later, in 1993, Genesis was chosen once again to be repeated, this time on BBC Two. As part of Doctor Who's 30th anniversary, a different story featuring each Doctor was screened on the channel, with Genesis airing over six weeks, between the 8th of January and the 12th of February. Here are the viewing figures for that repeat, which averaged out at around 2.2 million viewers. Again, on the surface, it's a very low figure, but as often is with these 90s repeats, A, it was going out on BBC Two, a channel that rarely achieves the same high figure seen on BBC One, and B, Doctor Who had been off the air with new episodes for around four years, so the general interest in the programme was nowhere near as high as it once had been. Genesis of the Daleks received one last repeat in the February of 2000 on BBC Two, but unfortunately we don't have the viewing figures for this transmission although information states that the low audiences for this repeat caused Doctor Who to be dropped from BBC Two schedules, and that's something we never want to hear, is it? If you missed all of these repeats back in the day, aren't you lucky that you have so many different ways in which you can experience it today? You have the Target book from 1976, or its audio adaptation from 2017. To watch it, you have the VHS release from 1991, packaged with the Sontaran experiment, and the standalone DVD release from 2006. This story is also available to watch on Blu-ray as part of the Season 12 collection set. At the end of the day, Genesis of the Daleks absolutely earns its place as being part of the pinnacle of Who stories. It's deeply atmospheric, it's not afraid to show off some of the darker aspects of war, the characterizations of both the Khaleds and the Thals are fantastic, and perhaps most iconic, the introduction of Dalek creator Davros. With his debut, viewers were treated to a brilliant performance, but also one of the most in-depth characters the universe of Doctor Who would ever have. And even though he appears to meet his demise at the conclusion of the adventure, it would be far from the last time that his path would cross with the Doctors. When the time is right, we will emerge and take our rightful place as the supreme power of the universe! The fifth and final story from Season 12 is Revenge of the Cybermen. Returning to the Nerva Beacon, the Doctor, Sarah and Harry find the station ravaged by plague, but caused by what? The Doctor's suspicions are aroused by Voga, a planet with a link to one of his deadliest foes. The Cybermen are coming. This story is comprised of four episodes, which began airing on the 19th of April 1975 and concluded on the 10th of May. Here are the individual viewing figures for all four episodes, and whilst they are strong, it's a shame that the final story of Season 12 couldn't pull in a 10 million figure like the rest of the stories did. But saying that, with two episodes apiece in the 8 and 9 million range, Revenge, I would argue, rounds off the success that the fourth Doctor's first season was able to achieve. For the top 40 programmes, despite the lower figures, all four parts ended up charting, the peak being part four, which finished up at 22nd. So, did Revenge of the Cybermen have the same positive factors going for it as the previous stories? For promotion, an unlikely ally sprung up which helped raise the profile of Doctor Who even higher with the general public. Weetabix, a popular breakfast item, began a promotional tie-in with the program, encouraging people to buy packs of Weetabix to collect various cardboard cutouts, a tie-in that proved to be incredibly popular for both parties. Including this, Tom gave an interview to the Daily Express on the day of Part 1's broadcast, in which, amongst other things, he reveals that he had signed on for a second year, pleasing millions who had come to love him almost from the word go. The competition over at ITV was, you guessed it, weak as anything. The same old shows came to the fore, sale of the century, new faces, reruns of old shows, you get the idea. But if competition was weak, why weren't Revenge of the Cybermen's viewing figures much higher like the previous stories? Well, going out in April and May, with warmer weather and lighter nights beginning to emerge, less people would have been huddled around their tellies at 5.30pm. But the main element of this story that was going to draw up some notable attention was the long-awaited return of the Cybermen. The Silver Giants hadn't appeared on screen for seven years, last being seen in 1968's The Invasion, and only making brief cameos in the interlude. 
unfortunately never having a dedicated adventure in the Third Doctor's era. Sadly, their return here isn't often regarded as being triumphant. The Cybermen here are markedly different. Everything from their voices, their demeanour, their attitudes, their very emotional moments despite supposedly having no emotion, it almost seems like a contradiction of everything we thought we knew about them. Are there some good and redeemable moments? Oh, sure there are. But ultimately, in my view, Revenge of the Cybermen isn't the best outing for the metallic monsters. Still want to give a watch, it's certainly entertaining, but maybe not for the right reasons. Overall, this story attracted an average of 9 million viewers, a 0.6 drop from the previous story. Whilst that may seem a shame, to close out your 12th season with 9 million viewers on average tuning in, what an achievement that is! It may not have been the greatest comeback for the Cybermen, but their appearance is welcomed after such a long absence, and their inclusion in Season 12 marks the first time that three of the program's heaviest hitters, the Daleks, the Sontarans and the Cybermen, would all appear in the same group of adventures, something that wouldn't happen again for another 10 years. To have a gander at Revenge of the Cybermen today, you have the Target book from 1976, and no audio adaptation as of yet, at the time of this recording. To watch it though, you have plenty of options. Revenge was the first Doctor Who story to be released on VHS, in an omnibus edition back in 1983. Although, as you can see, there's a few things wrong with this cover. So the next year, in 1984, it was re-released with more suitable artwork. It was also released on Betamax, Video 2000, and later on, Laserdisc. An episodic version was released eventually on VHS in 1999. The story got its DVD release in 2010, packaged with Silver Nemesis in a double feature box set, and it's also available to view on Blu-ray, as part of the Season 12 collection set. But despite all the jokes and the sassy cyber leader memes, Revenge is a story that is worth your time at least once. If anything, the lead cast continue to cement the wonderful chemistry that they have between them. There's some pretty ambitious location filming within some eerie caves, and many a memorable moment. Memorable for the right reasons? I'll leave that up to you. <laughs> So that's season 12, the five stories that comprise it and the ratings that they garnered. With the transmission of episode 4 of Revenge of the Cybermen, season 12 was brought to an end, concluding a slightly shorter run of nearly five months, comprised of 20 episodes across five stories. All 20 of those episodes exist today in the BBC archives, and thankfully from here on out, all broadcast episodes of Doctor Who do still exist in some form at the BBC. Now let's have a look at the story averages for this season. We can see the most successful story in terms of viewing figures is The Ark in Space, which pulled in 11.1 million viewers on average. The lowest point comes with the season finale, Revenge of the Cybermen, which averages out at 9 million. But come on, do you think 9 million viewers over 4 weeks in 1975 is something to be looked down upon? 9 million viewers is something Patrick Troughton never got sadly with his stories. This is the first time on our journey so far that every single story of a season has averaged at least 9 million viewers. With three of the five tales here climbing over 10 million, that certainly does tell you something about the continued rise in popularity and audience reach that Doctor Who was experiencing in the 1970s. Whether it was the return of old monsters, the inclusion of new ones, or primarily just the appeal and likability of the new Doctor, all of these factors helped contribute to the push that the show needed to go through yet another monumental transition in its long history. Now, as we always do, let's work out the overall average for this season. By combining the average ratings of each story, we can calculate that the average for Season 12 of Doctor Who stands at around roughly 10.1 million viewers. That's a 1.3 million increase from Season 11's overall average, and is now the second highest season average overall, only behind Season 2, which still reigns supreme with 10.4 million. But hey, for a Doctor's debut season to average at over 10 million viewers is staggering. Season 12, if anything, proved that for the fourth lease of life for the show, it was going to be anything but dull. Despite having some similarities in tone and style to the previous few years, the five stories seen here all offer something different and for the most part succeed in what they're trying to achieve. Robot gives us a good look at this brand new Doctor, what makes him tick, and just how those close to him handle this new persona. The Ark in Space is an atmospheric thriller, one that somehow for the most part manages to make bubble wrap look somewhat scary. The Sontaran experiment, while short, no pun intended, offers us further insight into how the creatures think and operate. Genesis of the Daleks is debatably the crown jewel, adding a whole new dimension to the monster's backstory, whilst introducing a character so important and so detailed that it would almost be impossible to think that we wouldn't see him again. And Revenge of the Cybermen is… well, it's Revenge of the Cybermen. It is good. 
But I don't mean that disrespectfully. It has its fans. And I think that's why Season 12 is seen as such a good jumping on point as the years have gone on. Every story offers you something different. Every story I would argue is fairly accessible, easy to understand and get into. And ultimately, each story is very watchable. You can debate about a story's quality, whether in terms of the writing, performances, design, whatever, but if the story is entertaining and keeps you watching, then in my view, it's done its job with great effect. But just because you start off strong doesn't mean it will last forever. Will season 13 continue to pull in viewers of 10 million plus week after week, or will the public tire of this new Doctor and drop away to other shows? You'll have to join me next time to find out. So those are the ratings details for season 12. I hope you enjoyed this numerical look back at the fourth Doctor's first set of stories, some of which have gone down in Who history to be some of the highest regarded tales the programme has ever produced. If you want to watch a full in-depth retrospective about the fourth Doctor's era, then I highly recommend Richard from Clever Dick Films and his fantastic documentary series. If you want to read more about Doctor Who in the making of it, I highly recommend the complete history series of books, which I used as reference for this video. If you want to keep up to date with this series, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram, and if you want to see new episodes of the show early, then you can by supporting us over on the AMTV Patreon. Please consider leaving a like, subscribing to the channel, and leaving your thoughts on Season 12 in the comments section below. I've been Adam Martin from AMTV, and we will see you next time for Season 13.